Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you for joining us, uh, Brian. Oh, my pleasure, I, man. Are you I, kidding I think me? It's, uh, it's about two o'clock. So maybe this is a good time to, or two o'clock Pacific. It's a good time to get started. Right. Um, so welcome everyone to another Apollo Neuroscience webinar. Um, we are so excited to have you all here joining us for a very exciting conversation and actually a rare conversation that I think we get to have with Dr. Brian Donahue. Uh, Dr. Brian Donahue is an interventional cardiologist who's been in practice for over 30 years. He attended Georgetown University School of Medicine and trained in internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He's received additional training in cardiology at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles, UCLA, and in interventional cardiology at the Emory University School of Medicine. And his research is centered predominantly on the care of patients with acute myocardial infarction or, or uh, what most will know as a heart, heart attack, um, as well as um, collaborating with leading cardiologists in the field, uh, working with athletes, um, working with natural interventions and techniques uh, to help um, improve outcomes in chronic illnesses. Um, and Dr. Donahue is also a board member of the Board of Medicine and has given many presentations at the American College of Cardiology, um, annual scientific sessions. He's received a Fulbright Award, which is a very prestigious award that is uh, rarely given out. Um, and he has just been a pleasure to work with as a colleague and a friend over the years. And so we're really excited to have him here to talk about uh, cardiovascular health um, and what we can do at times of stress to really improve our overall health, our cardiovascular health, our longevity, and sort of how the cardiovascular system, the heart and the vessels really tie together into um, a whole health for, for all of us and what we can do to optimize that. So Dr. Donahue, thank you again for joining us. No, Dave, the, the pleasure is entirely mine. I was thinking as you were uh, making those kind comments that when all of that odyssey oh, began, mm -hmm. Francisco, I didn't have any, uh, any gray hair and now I do. Well, you've, you've come a long way in your career and really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us that you've, and the wisdom you've accumulated over the years. I think the first thing that I wanted to ask you, which I know is something that many of us have on our minds is, you know, how, how does stress affect our heart health? And could you explain a little bit about good stress versus bad stress, you stress versus distress? Right. So, so a lot of this work, as you know, well, Dave, harkens back to the to the 1960s, a pioneer in the field, Hans Seel, really began to detail what is the, what are the consequences over time from the grinding, wearing away stress. You're aware, as I know, and many of our viewers are, that there's really this kind of cour de ballet, this little bit of balance in the nervous system. On the one hand, there's the parasympathetic nervous system, and on the other hand, there's the sympathetic nervous system. And in the ideal physiology, those two, um, those two influences would come to a kind of balance. What oftentimes happens on the other hand, over the years, is that one of those becomes a little more dominant. So the, 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 the sympathetic nervous system, most of us, I think, uh, in the audience, and heaven knows you, are familiar with as this uh, gripping uh, nervous system that governs our response to stress in terms of fear and, fl and flight and, and so forth. And it's not like it's a bad thing. It's just that over time, it comes to become the member of the table that just talks too much. And so there's not a lot of conversation. There's just this kind of this um, uh, finger wagging. So it's turning out to be the case. It was actually a, a, a very forward-looking thinker at UCLA in the old days named Keith Wallace, who is a PhD, and he wrote his uh, PhD thesis on an endlessly intriguing idea, which is, could there be a biology of enlightenment? Really talking about, is it, could it be the case that the nervous system would be structured in this intimate partnership with the vasculature to create an environment that would facilitate health and even higher states of consciousness. So in the age of science, we probably ought to be thinking a little bit more rigorously about some of these things, concepts that we can validate, um, 
research that we can that we can present in an objective way to really begin talking about expanding our happiness, our well-being, and our happiness. So good stress is uh, basically stress over which we have some control. So people that are that that are executives and run the world, it's true that they they have stress, but they're really defining their environment. Bad stress is the guy standing in the Lordsville, Ohio plant, putting the bolts on the tire and feeling entirely disconnected from the premise. And so, uh, so in and one of the expressions from the process of that itself, is the right. sympathetic. Yeah, and one of the expressions of that, Dave, is that is that overarching, overbearing, sympathetic nervous system, and that's where that grinding effect comes from. It's, it's sort of this, as you said, it's a disconnection almost from the process of living itself, right? That we're disconnected from, the, from what we're doing. We could be disconnected from the tasks that we're doing, from the thoughts we're having to the point where we, we don't feel like we're even a part of the life that we're living. It's such a fascinating way to think about it. And I know, you know we've talked about this many times, but, but the ancient Buddhists and Ayurvedic traditions talk about this quite a bit. Right. They should do. And in fact, in the Ayurvedic tradition, there, there are very practical approaches to this whole idea of cultivating that perfect balance. In English, uh, if you fall down and cut yourself on the ice in Pittsburgh, a risk that you don't have in Sunsplash, California, you go to the doctor and he sutures the, the, the wound, which comes from the Sanskrit root word sutra, which means to bind together. So in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, there are formulas to bring together, if you will, those experiences of the transcendent, a very deep, settled awareness with everyday waking state. And the idea of suturing them together is to inculcate them so that they're no longer, just as you said, Dave, they're no longer separate. So that idea of kind of having a, a whole fulfilling life right here, right now in our, in our experience is something I think that ironically in the age of science, we can begin talking about with a little bit more precision and dispatch than what's the case maybe 1250 years before the birth of Jesus. It's so fascinating to be able to have this conversation with a cardiologist. Yeah. It's, it's a well, rare one indeed. <laughs> It's you began by saying that this is a rare conversation and, 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 and maybe some of the f viewers tapping in thought, it's also a way overdue conversation. Because all these conversations about health have to do with how we keep our arteries open and how we keep our, our, our emotional life intact. But rare is the occasion we talk about well, how we expand happiness. Wouldn't that really be an important goal of our lives that we, that we, I imagine that if, if, if I actually created the view that I'm looking out over here in Southwestern Pennsylvania, I would want that you come and enjoy it. And likewise, one imagines that the creator would be, would be thrilled that we find the creation fulfilling. So I think this is a kind of new conversation that we can actually dare to have in this, in this time frame. Well said. And I think, you know, would you, would you go as far to say that good stress or you stress, EU stress is akin to a kind of stress that, as you said, we're somewhat in control over, but also facilitates growth towards joy and happiness or promoting or inviting joy and happiness into our lives through the growth process. Whereas distress, the stress we look at as potentially destructive or harmful, is the opposite. It's stress that actually can sap happiness from our lives and actually potentially contribute to suffering over time. Yeah, it's, it's been said before by people, heavenly, heaven knows wiser than me, that the ideal nervous system is akin to running your finger over the surface of the calm water. So at the moment of contact, the finger gently displaces the water. And as the finger passes, the water returns to its rest state. So the idea is not to avoid stress. The idea is for us not to live in some kind of uh, cocoon, but our, the idea is for us to respond perfectly to stress. That is to say, to know on the one hand, the needs of the times, but on the other hand, to not be in any way overwhelmed by the needs of the times. I recently 
made that huge life mistake, Dave, of buying a sailboat. And in, in thinking this through just a little bit, it occurs to me that the boat with the deep keel looks just like the boat with no keel at the dock. And they're actually, it's not until you exit the harbor and sheet the sail in that you realize that the boat with no keel is overwhelmed by the moment. And it doesn't therefore navigate its way through the sea. As on the other hand, the boat with the deep keel is steady and on tack. So the idea is again, that we wanna feel the wind and the waves and the tide, but we wanna govern them. We don't wanna be governed by them. And so it's that, so the helmsman feels not the stress of the open sea, but instead the thrill of it because he's able to navigate his way across. And so it is in life that we don't, it's not this idea that we somehow want to hide from life, just the opposite. We wanna be lions in winter. We wanna be governors of life, not just, in, not just inheritors of it. So well said and such an amazing metaphor um, for that. I really appreciate the way that you describe that. I think that leads really well into the next question I have for you, which is, you know, can you tell us a little bit about HRV and, and sort of a heart rate variability? What is heart rate variability? And uh, how does it, what does it tell us about, the, about our nervous system? So I think it's really an incredibly interesting parameter. Most of our, our participants today are familiar with it in a vague way, but l- let me just give you a brief little primer. So the first thing is there's nothing new about this. Turns out that you can dig through the old vascular literature and hear uh, forward-looking doctors talking about, about um, heart rate variability 200 years ago, but it's kind of gotten legs as an idea here about over the last 20 years. And this is the basic concept. The things that are, that are youthful by their nature are flexible. So if you press your finger down on a young artery, it yields to the touch and then bounces back. So you might say the artery is compliant. If you press your fingers down on an old artery, it neither yields to the pressure nor bounces back akin more to a styrofoam tube. So the young artery is compliant. That means that it dilates and constricts. So likewise, the perfect vascular system is fleet footed. It isn't stiff. The old doctor is called it woody. Very good turn of phrase. So we want that the, that the vascular system is endlessly nimble, fleet footed, arabesque. So if we were to look, for example, Dave, at your pupils over the few minutes we've been spending together, we would find that they've dilated and constricted countless times in response to the changing ambient light. So they know. Likewise, the vascular system in its perfect iteration knows how to care for itself. And so it dilates and constricts. All these things are variables. So one of the things that varies is heart rate. So we can imagine in our Woody or Stuck model that the heart rate is a fixed number. It's 82 beats a minute. But in the more nimble model of life, the heart rate is just an innocent mirror reflecting the environment. So of course, it's always changing, just like your pupils. Mm -hmm. So heart rate variability is a very important and powerful iteration of health. Remember that we talked earlier about health being that, that being established in the big S self health. And so the, in that situation, we're always responsive to the needs of the times. So heart rate variability is a, is a measure of how much variability there is in consecutive beats. There's a little formula that has been developed by by physiologists, Dr. Guyton in particular, and it gives us a way of understanding uh, um, uh, health. And it's it's a really actually a very powerful single uh, 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 handle that we can uh, can look at. And what we see is that it changes over time, not surprisingly. Ask yourself, what part of your vascular physiology doesn't change over time? The greater the variability in heart rate, in general, the more nimble and healthy the vascular physiology is. And so that's, I think, what's so important about the research that you've done, because over the last 20 years, a lot of people have been talking about heart rate variability. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the only 
technology that I'm personally aware of, and I have perused this literature a little bit, that actually affects heart rate variability is Apollo Neuro. And to, to my knowledge, that is also the case, which is why part of why we developed it was we felt the need to develop something that we could give people that could help modulate autonomic tone or help to effectively modulate resilience and help the body be in as, as, an adap as adaptable as it can be in any situation, not just when you're feeling your best, but all the time. Um, as often as possible, whether you're, because most of us realistically are not necessarily feeling our best a lot of the time. And so, you know, just diving a little bit deeper into, into this, could you talk a little bit about why, and, and we know, and, and just to recap for everyone, the literature is very, very consistent in the scientific literature in about heart rate variability over the last 30 or 40 years in particular, talking about how we, can track heart rate variability, as you said, as a sign of the changes and responses from our body to the environment. And also the responses of our body to the internal environment, right? The milieu interior, as I think Claude Bernard described it, right? The experience of, of what's happening within our thoughts, within our minds, within our emotional bodies, all of these kinds of things, in addition to our spiritual, this whole complex of inter, of, 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 uh, experiences shifts our heart rate variability as a sign that our body is reacting to the environment. So that being said, can you talk a little bit about why H or when would someone expect their HRV to be the highest? And my understanding is it's during sleep and rest when the body is in a maximal recovery mode. And when would people expect HRV to be the lowest? So, so Let's go back to the Cour de Ballet principle that we talked about a second ago, David, that little, um, little private conversation between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So when the kids in the second grade classroom are talking out of turn, the way the teacher regains the moment is to speak loudly and forcefully and capture that. And that's the sympathetic nervous system. So as you said, during periods of rest, also, let me just add, during periods of meditation, um, as the body settles down and the, and, and the sympathetic nervous system is maybe just a little bit less intrusive, it allows for that physiology to settle and be, to some extent, a more perfect mirror of the environment. That is to say that when the, when the, when the sympathetic nervous system is not is not cracking the whip over the poor tired horse's shoulder, it comes to a more comfortable place of its own volition. So during periods of rest, um, during periods of meditation, during periods of just quietude, the heart rate variability is generally higher. During periods of exhaustion, maybe impending or candid illness, um, generally stress, the heart rate variability sinks. And there's no surprise to any of that, right? So, 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 um, and it's turning out to be the case. One of the fascinating things that came out of some of the early literature regarding Apollo Neuro in particular, I think, is the dispatch and the facility with which this happens. These aren't galactic changes that take place like I decided to start lifting some weights and I basically look the same as I did before, okay? So, but this, so it's not quite like that. This is a, a, a something that happens in a matter of seconds. Let me just pose this concept to you, Dave, and to our participants. The body has a memory of its own perfect well-being. If any one of our participants right now at this moment were to smell the smell of their grandmother's kitchen, Though it's been five decades, they wouldn't have, a, a, they, they would know it immediately. It's like it's built into us. So that perfect function of the body is built into us. It's a memory and an intelligence that we have. So one of the things that happens when we settle down or when we transcend, or even just when we, when we rest, is that that sympathetic overbearing the mother-in-law always scolding begins to slowly dissipate and the body settles down into a more organic state. And that's when heart rate variability is at its greatest. In general, people who um, 
are athletically uh, fit. Um, and and here, here's the concept there. The, the idea is to do less, but accomplish more. So when the heart has adapted to athletic performance, each stroke of the heart provides the body with more blood. So that means that we do less, meaning heart rate is slower, but accomplish more. So that kind of adaptation, that slower heart rate, I take care of a whole cadre of professional athletes. And sometimes you wonder if we're getting victimized by that trend, because some of these young people have heart rates really and truly in the 30s and 40s. And when they sneeze, it becomes a little anxiety provoking for the cardiologist. But the idea is that this is a very important insight, kind of key into the boudoir to, to our broader arena of health. Apollo Neuro has shown itself, in my experience at least, uniquely to affect heart rate variability. And here's the other surprise, to do it right away. So, so we drink the water, the thirst is quenched. We have this gentle effect on the parasympathetic and, and sympathetic nervous system, and there is voila, a change reminding all of us that we have that intelligence and that governing uh, knowledge. I, I love the way you describe that and I, the body having a memory of what it knows to be the way it functions optimally. And, you know, I think it's really important to mention that, that, you know, while we have seen, as you said, that Apollo does shift the body within minutes in a controlled setting, when we don't have other stressors around that are interfering, wow. it's also important to note that literally every single thing in our lives, which is something you said earlier, but just to, to reflect uh, once again, every single thing that happens in our lives outside of us and inside of us, inside of us being things like traumatic memories or worry or et cetera, any number of other things, um, illness as well, all of these can result in reducing heart rate variability. And so even if you use Apollo, the, you know, you may not people, you may feel different when you use it, but your consumer wearables at home may not be precise or accurate enough to be able to track the way the changes in the short term, the way that we see those changes occur in the lab. That, that being said, Right. That when we track people in the lab in the controlled setting, we see these changes within a few minutes, but then over without any other interference around, right? It's been done in an electromagnetically shielded room with clinical EKG machines and EEG machines and pupillometry and everything done very rigorously in a scientific manner. Um, in the real world, it's a very different story, right? We don't have these highly controlled environments. Right. We don't have people where they're isolated from all their other stressors and we're isolated from our substance use and we're isolated from the work stress and all these things. And so HRV is actually impacted by all of this stuff and actually our cardiovascular health at, uh, on the whole, which HRV is a reflection of is impacted by all of this stuff. And I think there's one really fascinating publication that just came out that I wanna share with you all that came out in JMIR, um, and this is a study that came out showing that the using, I believe, using the Apple Watch, that HRV, when looking at folks who, I believe this was in about 276 healthcare workers from Mount Sinai Health Systems, that these people have a change, a significant drop in heart rate variability prior to developing COVID long before people even get a diagnosis. And so that you can actually predict relatively accurately whether someone is going to develop any illness, but in this case, they studied COVID because when we have low HRV and our bot, which indicating that our bodies are not well recovered, it means that resources are getting diverted away from our immune system to our survival fight or flight uh, the survival system, the, the system that is supposed to protect us from immediate threat in the moment, which means that immunity, creativity, empathy, uh, digestion, reproduction, all of these create creativity, all of these things that are not deemed absolutely necessary for survival when we're running from a lion get deprioritized and, and turned off. Right. And so then the next question that I would, that I would, you know, go to for you, Brian is, how does the cardiovascular system manage all of this? You know, and how do we, and, and, and how does it, how can we optimize the system to function healthier? How do we remind the system? Apollo is one tool, but there are many others that, are, uh, that exist and have existed for thousands of years. How do we remind our system 
of its memory of perfect or optimal functioning? So it's such an incredibly timely question. Let me just share with you some data about all this because people watching, they're not so much interested in yet another metric of their well being, some yet one more thing for us to track. They're interested, I think, in three things feeling well, living long, and growing old with their family. So those are our goals. Our goals are, and, but, but these, let, let me share with you some interesting data. So when we settle down through meditation, we all agree that there's a kind of soporific effect, probably a good thing. Maybe it's like flossing your teeth or swinging by church once in a while. Let me posit to you this. This is an essential thing. It's not a soft add-on. In a recent study um, uh, published in, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, it turned out that women who lived in dense urban areas littered with crime and, and, and exhausting, debilitating, chronic stress were randomized to meditate or not meditate. If you were actually the advocate of meditation, you might tell the college authors proposing the study that, you know, this headache is so bad that our medicine probably isn't going to treat it. Okay, so it creates beta error, meaning that there really is a difference, but our study failed to show it. Turned out in the group that were randomized to uh, meditation, there was a nearly 40% reduction. Now listen to this in mortality. Like just think that through for a second. So if I was to show you a medicine that dropped your uh, cholesterol, cut it in half, nobody would expect to see a 40% reduction in mortality. So it would be like saying, we're gonna randomize people to uh, drinking water versus remaining permanently parched and see the outcome, right? So it's just an amazing difference. So what does it mean that this is something that the heart longs for? It, it has an ambition for that more settled uh, state. It's, and, and it's, you could argue, I would argue that it's not, again, it's not a soft add-on. It is, they, they say in India that the wise gardener waters the root. We could add that absent the wise gardener, the plant can't grow. So that idea of transcending and settling down is essential, I would argue, to, to, to feeling well, living long and, and, and growing old. The, um, the other data that we, we didn't uh, talk about just a second ago is, is equally interesting to me, particularly thinking about Apollo Neuro uh, now, uh, Dave, and that's the blood pressure data. Let me just share with you some thoughts on this. So right now in America, whatever this is, February of 2021, one half of all adults in America, one half of our audience is hypertensive. Think about that. It's just an incredible, and recently guidelines for what is normotensive have been adjusted. So that the top number is now 110. So if we ask how many of us have a blood pressure at 3.30 in the afternoon uh, of 110 answer, probably pretty low. And so, so, so in addition to the heart rate variability, one of the other, uh, and actually as intriguing to me personally and professionally of the, of the application of this technology was a meaningful drop in systolic blood pressure. As a general rule of thumb, it's a little bit reductio ad absurdum, but the top number in blood pressure relates more to the consumer, meaning the brain, the kidney, so forth. The bottom number reflects the environment in which the heart lives. So the top number, uh, recent data has suggested, has a great deal to do, for example, with risk of dementia, cognitive impairment. So what does it really all mean? It means that risk reduction is wildly underplayed in America. And if we, to go back to Dave's point, um, how then do we attack suffering? And the answer is from all sides. So, so, uh, so Dave introduced the point elegantly as always, but it's just important to drive it home. 
So if you lived in the high crime neighborhood, you'd lock the back door, the front door, and latch the window so that all points of entry of badness are covered. So it is with our, with, in our lives. So Apollo Neuro becomes an important tool in, a, in a, a chest of tools that we use to preserve our well-being and percolate that memory of our broader well-being. So, so in the recent days, in the 1980s, to date myself, when I was training, there was a sought after molecule, think like the holy grail, somehow in some sepulcher somewhere, maybe it actually exists, right? Like Indiana Jones. And the holy grail was something called endothelial relaxant factor. And nobody knew quite what it was. It was like big footprints in the snow. You can infer the abominable snowman size and shape. But some two physicians actually in the late 1980s identified exactly what this is, endothelial relaxant factor, ERF, became nitrous, a, 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 a nitrous product, which is a gaseous molecule that dilates arteries. And it works through a very simple method of amplification. It's a very short half-life. And that turned out to be the secret as to how it is that arteries both dilate and constrict so that these, these, these tissues auto-regulate. They have great governing intelligence. So the kidneys dilate and constrict. The, uh, the, then if you look at this whole orchestration of the vascular physiology, you think, where's the sap that runs through the, through the tree that becomes the, the, the branch, the, the, the flower and the petal? And the sap is, are these little products that exist in a fleeting way that allow the arteries to govern themselves. Techniques like Apollo Neuro like meditation, also uh, like diet, I'd like to have a word about that as well, but allow for the governing intelligence of the arteries to be restored. Coronary disease is not plaque narrowing, hear me on this. So people that have say a 40% narrowing in the arteries, you might say, well, 40%, how's their stress test look? Normal, how do they feel? Fine, no chest pain, 40% doesn't limit flow, and yet, 70% of people who have sudden death have a 50% or less narrowing. So help me understand, why did they die? And the answer is that the plaque narrowing, more than a anatomical issue, is a governance issue, right? It's, it's that the endothelium has lost its ears. It's like got earwax and it can't hear this conversation. So it doesn't dilate, doesn't constrict, doesn't keep the platelets at bay. And all of those murmurings are important in terms of this governance. So I think that, that the Apollo Neuro takes its place in a kind of tool shed that we need to avail ourselves of with these broader canopy goals in mind. And as you said, this is very similar to the effect of meditation when practiced correctly, when deep breathing practices are practiced correctly. Also, I believe, as you said, diet and I, you know, the Ayurvedic traditions surrounding diet are, have been very much focused on the nurturing of this balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, and, and traditional, much of traditional Chinese medicine that involves the, the study and understanding of the fascia in our bodies is also uh, relegated to trying to achieve balance in in these states and so, or in the, in the body between these parts of the nervous system. And balance is actually a very interesting word because balance in many of these ancient traditions is actually synonymous with health. Yes. Correct? Yes. And, and so really, in a lot of ways, what we're both, what we're both talking about here as a psychiatrist and a cardiologist is we're talking about how do we, how do we, uh, you know, take this on from all angles, not just from just diet or just mental stress or just right. physical stress or just spiritual stress or emotional, what have you, but really looking at all of the different inputs into our lives and saying, how can we bring balance back to our lives? And there's a really, and I think this is a perfect segue actually into uh, Dr. Joe Maroon's work, right? Because Dr. Joe Maroon experienced a tremendous break in balance in his own life. He experienced burnout. And then he wrote about it, developing the technique of called square one, where he balances, I think it was, uh, what is it like mental, emotional, physical, yeah. spiritual, basically. Yeah. Right. Yes. And that, and that these, these lines, when you draw the square out for yourself of where you're spending most of your time or energy in mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical should form a square. 
and a square has equal sides. But for most of us, when we draw out that square and do the exercise, what we find is it's not a square, it's some kind of strange misshapen rectangle, right? And, or quadrangle. And that is not, that shows us visually a representation of where we are with the square being equal proportioned and balanced is where we want to be. That's right. And, and one of the few lifetime pleasures of living in Pittsburgh, as opposed to California, is to get the opportunity to go for these long walks with Dr. Joe Maroon and drill down into some of these details, which brings us to the issue of the following. Practical formulas. So practical formulas. How do we take this kind of arabesque and turn it into granular detail? So I, I just want to flesh out one thing that you said, uh, Dave, if I may. There are formulas, literally um, clear designed agendas, principally which come from the Ayurvedic tradition that are so practical. I mean, so useful in our, so let's just talk about it just for a second. So. It's been said before that it's different to grow up on the mountain than it is in the valley. What does it mean? That there's different laws of nature, different languages, different customs on the mountaintop. Shadows are short and they're long in the valley. And so we adapt to those laws of nature, creating customs, habits, diets, language, so forth. So once those things become established, we largely fulfill our lives, for example, eating no deference to mother, what mother fed us. And we don't oftentimes have occasion to look back at that. Likewise, the whole domain of custom and habit often becomes governors of our, of our, of our lives in a sense that we don't actually choose. So let's talk about choosing some things. So in the Vedic tradition, for example, um, there are important diurnal rhythms. So when the sun is breaking the Eastern horizon, that's the time for prayer, meditation and action. So if you think about it in the West, we talk about break fast. So your insulin levels are low in the morning. So if you uh, do your meditation and you do a devotional moment and then you go walk as the, as, the, as the animals are foraging and the birds are singing, there's way more bang for your buck than going to work all day, getting browbeaten and doing like I do and working. So, so just to have, as they say in the Vedic tradition, that we favor certain agendas. We're not slavishly adhering, but we just favor certain impulses. So up in the morning, tomorrow, do a little thought experiment, look on Google, wherever you live, and, at, and see what time the sun rises. Put your head outside the window two minutes before the sun comes up, and then two minutes after. When the sun comes up, the birds start to move, the animals forge, nature wakes up. Not surprising, that would be the time for us to wake up. We should be very light on calories during the morning hours. I think that lots of our participants, you know, this afternoon and evening are familiar with this idea of daily intermittent fasting. But so in general, we just don't favor calories in the early come. We have our little program in the morning and out we go, lots of fluids. Ideally, as impractical as this is, the big meal comes at noon. And why would that be? Because the sun is high in the sky at, at, at noon. In the Eastern tradition, the fire of digestion, what's called Agni, is a very important premise. So if we throw fuel in the fire when it's a roaring inferno, we get combustion. If we throw fuel in the fire when it's a glowing ember, we get smoke. So smoke early in life is joint pain, anxiety, so forth. Later in life, vascular disease, malignancy, yet later in life, dementia. So we're looking to not have that smoke in the body. The second meal is by six in the evening, and then we're done for the night. The body begins the process of preparing for sleep between six and seven. One hour of sleep before midnight is worth two hours of sleep after midnight. Ideally, we wake up six in the morning, no alarm. So that's just an agenda to keep in mind, the kind of Vedic approach to just practical living. In Luke, it's pointed out, the gospel according to Luke, that I fast twice a week. So in general, eating less and eating more wisely is an enormously helpful thing. And in general, length of life tends to vary inversely with body mass. So it's, it's a, it's, we wanna weigh throughout our lives what we weighed or should have weighed at 21, but do it without ever thinking about it. Just have the wind at our back and we're never aware of all those struggles. So if we keep doing what we're doing, which is eating pot roast at eight o'clock, 
it's hard for us to actually have that sort of sense of organic momentum. But those little practical things, and it's interesting that people at any moment in their lives can adapt that and see if it's true. Just see if, for example, your joints hurt or you're a little fatigued. See what happens between now and Easter if you just make those little adjustments. Um, in terms of the content of what we eat, we really do favor a plant-based agenda um, for lots and lots of reasons. And those are big asks, I realize. But, um, but, but again, it's a testable premise. And, and, and one way to, to, is to adopt some of those things and just ask after four to six weeks, how are we doing? If you wanted to grow your hair and you went to the mirror today and then tomorrow, you'd think, well, this hair growing doesn't work so well. But just grow the hair and never think about it again, come back in six months and there it is, long and rich. So you've brought up two really fascinating topics that are of my favorite topics that really inspired me when we were developing Apollo. And one of those topics is the holy grail of healing, right? And the other topic is nitric oxide, nitrous oxide, yeah. nitric oxide and they really overlap, right? Nitric oxide is uh, known to be the chief vasodilator that is the early phase reactor, right? It's the, yes. it's, it's the molecule that was found um, it, to be able to rapidly dilate blood vessels to allow blood flow into specific organs or parts of the body. For example, in recovery, allowing rapid release of blood and nutrients and waste and, and the ability to also carry away waste from the parts of our bodies that are working the hardest. Um, and, uh, and so in the, in the recovery state, that would be you know, the empathy parts of our brains, the yes. creative parts of our brains, the parts of our brains that involve looking into ourselves, thinking about ourselves, feeling our own bodies, um, also digestion, um, reproduction, et cetera. All the stuff that's not that important immunity, that's not that important when we're running from a lion in the moment, right? right. And then when we're running from a lion in the moment or we're recovering safely and feeling calm and we have an inkling that there is a lion outside of our den, right? The first things that happen are without us even consciously being aware of what's happening, the body has a way of releasing nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, in a very specific pattern that results in a diversion or reallocation of blood and resources to the skeletal muscles, the motor cortex, and the, and the amygdala and the parts of our brains and our bodies that are our heart, our lungs to get us out of that situation as quickly as possible, right? And and so Apollo was really fascinating because when I was working with patients with PTSD, as one example, all of these people seemed to be thinking that they were running from a lion at every moment of their lives. They never felt safe and they would talk about never feeling safe. 100%. And, and, and so when we developed Apollo, we really were trying to tap into this, what we call the evolutionarily conserved pathway of safety, which we can activate in many different ways, right? As you mentioned, meditation and breath work are one way that we can take control of how safe we are in the moment. Because as soon as we take a deep breath, there's an opportunity that our subconscious minds recognize that says, if I have the time to intentionally pay attention to this feeling of air coming into my nose and mouth and lungs right now, then I can't possibly be running from a lion. Because if I was running from a lion, my body would not, my, would, my body would not allow me to think about my breath and the feeling of my breath. And this is therefore, and this is actually the same mechanism as touch and why touch activates safety responses and has so effectively to facilitate bonding between humans and early mammals for tens of millions of years. So could you, could we talk a little bit about the way that we can modulate the system and the way that Apollo can modulate the system? Yes, I was just, just reminded actually by by Dr. Maroon of the, uh, the Proust uh, idea of remembrance of things past. So it's good that we be on the one hand connected to our past. Another thing that we not be victimized by it. Okay, and that it not be this tremendous weight that we carry around and it becomes the governing element of our moment to moment experience. So uh, it might interest you, um, Dave, to know that in the basic science uh, circles, every year <laughs> there's a molecule of the year, okay? And uh, nitrous oxide was the molecule of the year 
1992. And it's the general expectation that one or two uh, Nobel prizes in medicine and physiology will, will arise from the work that was done in that sense, because nobody had any, any idea. That's why it was called endothelial relaxing factor, because you could see in the cath lab and other places that in response to certain uh, signals, arteries dilate. I'll give you a little home cooking example. So if you took your, your, your left hand, wrapped it around your right wrist and squeezed as hard as you could for the next uh, 15 seconds, the right hand would become, uh, would become plethoric and red when you released it. I spent a year of my life asking, how does that actually happen? What is reactive hyperemia? Uh, you might say that the hand flushing is the circulatory analogy of that safe space that you describe in the, in the psychiatric moment. So it turns out that, that it's principally, but not exclusively, but principally nitric oxide that basically creates that powerful vasodilatation. Here's the thing, just like the pupils we talked about a little while ago, it's important that this be a very discreet, immediate uh, event, that it not linger. So it's not like cheap perfume that you can smell in the hallway next week. It comes and goes like that. So this is, that's why it was so hard to find. This is the bluebird that you, you just don't actually ever see. Um, and, and when so, you say immediate, it's like, we're talking milliseconds, we're right? talking milliseconds. less than a second is the half-life of this. Molecule. Exactly right. And, and, and that's right. And if you take a little nitrous oxide and put it into a syringe and inject it into a, a, a rabbit before the syringe is empty, the animal is expired. And that's because it induces this hypotensive moment. So it's made locally and broken down locally. And it becomes then this currency of exchange. It's like a transaction between you and me where I give you $7 uh, for, the, for the drink. So it's a local exchange. And it turns out that um, it turns out it's, it's hard to measure. It's this fleeting, shy creature that governs everything. But there's another piece to it, Dave, if I may develop just for a second. So it's the great Irish poet, William Butler Yeats once asked, how does one tell the dancer from the dance? Of course, the answer is one doesn't. The dancer is the dance. Here though, there's a subject and an object. There's the nitrous oxide and there's the responding endothelium. And they, to some extent, are separate. So you can have local production of very potent products like nitric oxide, like bradykinins, and the tissues are inert. That's what I was talking about earlier with the loss of that governing intelligence of the, of the arteries. So I play the, I do the beautiful dance and you sit there and fiddle with uh, your cell phone. So in a sense, we haven't connected. And so what we're, I'm very interested in at this point in my thinking about vascular biology is restoring, restoring that governing influence. There's now very persuasive data from my old haunt at UCSF and now other places. It first happened though at UCSF where people with plaque disease in their arteries underwent an aggressive intervention. Hear me on this though, no medicines, okay? No stent, an aggressive agenda of risk reduction with before and after heart cath and the arteries got better. And just like Apollo Neuro, they got better pretty quickly. They wanted to get better. They knew how to get better. It was the chronic injury that kept them in that diseased state. Now there's very interesting work on aging. The actual molecular biology of how we grow old has been very persuasively established. Here's the intriguing thing. It turns out in a small series of 15 patients in Los Angeles, non-randomized, this is all first in man kind of thing I'm sharing with you, but with an aggressive intervention, which we can talk about in a second, of the 15 patients, all of them, all of them were younger and about 40% were way younger when you look at the uh, extent to which the genome is methylated. That's thought to be the basis for aging. So again, it creates this model of a dynamic flux 
we all thought that you kind of get to be a certain age and then there's a slow decline and the only thing that matters is the slope of the line till you hit the ground. This creates an entirely new model of the, uh, as Dr. Maroon likes to say regarding your neuroplasticity, but this vascular flexibility, okay? So the body remembers its own wellness. A great doctor in 1699, Thomas Sindaham said that a man, we'll take that to be a man and a woman, but a human being, but he said a man is as old as his arteries. And now we have the opportunity to start tapping on heaven's door and maybe render them younger. That's such a, such a fascinating understanding of the space. And, and so with that in mind, how, how, does, how does a technology like Apollo actually stand to improve cardiovascular health when people use it in the short term or the long term? I, I think it's, a, it, it's such an important thing to talk about reconfiguring, I mean by that rebalancing that relationship between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems. Remember that the arteries to a large extent are the receiving conduit of neural traffic, right? So the way this all works, that the entire vasculature, particularly the heart, is endlessly innervated with these nerve endings. And these are small, this is more in, in your domain, but these the small so-called C like Carl, C type, T-Y-P-E, efferents, little tiny fronds of, of arteries, of, of nerves that go back and forth from the atrium, which is the receiving chamber of the heart to the low brainstem. And so it turns out that as the nervous system becomes more regulated, more coherent, more orderly, and without this endless drumbeat of the sympathetic nervous system, turns out that these arteries relax. Let me just impose one little bit of physical chemistry on you to give anxiety to all of us who suffered through all that. Here's what it turns out to be true. Dr. Pousseau in the, in the uh, uh, French background in the 1800s made the point that changes in the square of, a, of the radius lead to enormous drops in resistance. What does it mean? When arteries open a little bit, turns out that there's a huge drop in resistance. So when we dilate arteries with products like, like bradykinins and, 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 and the family of, uh, of nitrites, it turns out that these arteries dilate and even a tiny speck Ask yourself how life is if you're a 10th of an inch below the surface of the water versus a 10th of an inch above the surface of the water. So that little kind of what the physiologists call watershed moment is very analogous here. So small little changes. So we dial down the arterial constricting effect of the sympathetic nervous system, which tends to dominate the conversation. Let the quiet sister rise up and even have a moment of governing the conversation. And the physiology settles down. And I would argue, though this is a supposition on my part, and I, that there's a training effect here. And the training effect is such that as we, we, we're used to that, that moment of kind of hand gripping and teeth gnashing, we can also get used to that more comfortable moment. And we'll see it early on that we don't have quite such a long dwell time to sleep, that we do some athletic agenda here and we're used to kind of becoming a puddle of flesh for 20 minutes after. We notice now it's not quite so much. We recover with greater facility. Um, and so we might notice for those of us who follow these things that, that, that yes, that the heart rate slows measurably. And that again will facilitate increased heart rate variability. So I think that Apollo, it really has, it's again, it's the only, what really interested me from the first time that you and I met and talked about this in Starbucks is this is the only uh, intervention that I know of, including medicine, stenting, all the rest, that actually measurably affects heart rate variability. And if it does that, it becomes the key to lots of chambers that we can unlock. And now we're seeing ch similar changes in decreasing people who use it according to our best use guidelines on our website, um, which I've posted in the chat and I'll post again. But we're seeing that when people use Apollo regularly, we see reliable decreases in resting heart rate and right. average heart rate, in addition to improvements in HRV, which in a lot of ways control for each other. 
right? And these changes are not just seen in the moment, they're seen across time and cumulatively across time, which means the more that you, which is the same effect that we see with deep breathing practice. It's the same effect that we see with massage and fascial therapy work. It's the same thing we see with Ayurvedic therapy work. And it's the same thing we see with all the things that you teach people in cardiac rehab. Right. right? And, and so it's, it's this really fascinating ecosystem that we can now kind of modulate despite the fact that we've never been taught to do it. Because Apollo, in some ways, it's like you're saying that Apollo is a tool that like all of these other natural tools, it is a tool that can help to serve as a governor of these systems right. when we haven't necessarily learned how to govern them ourselves. Right. And it's interesting if you thought to yourself, I I'm going to figure out differential equations and they're really hard while this guy is next to me with his jackhammer drilling up the street. And you think, well, that's just not the right moment to learn about differential equations, right? And so likewise, this endless banging on a, on a, on a pan of the sympathetic nervous system, it's like everything else in life. So once it becomes habit, then we sort of fall back to those old ways. Lord Byron said back in 1806, the best prop of the future is somebody help me, the past. So we learn these traditions and, and it turns out that they turn around like the, like the dog that bites the owner. And they were originally perhaps of some value, um, we're now victimized by that, that, by that art. That's the, the point I, I wanted to, to make. And so we're victimized by that art form. Having said that, being made in the image of the creator, we can create new paradigms for ourselves, which is the endlessly interesting moment about being alive now is that, um, it, and, and really it, it's, it's never been so, honestly, it's never been so well established. We could make the point, I would make the point uh, that every experience that we have should be digested to bliss. Every experience that we have. So it's again, so it's, we're not looking to mood make. We're not looking to uh, see the world through the glass darkly. We're looking to adjust the physiology so that it's always evanescent and responsive, fleet footed and adroit without ever kind of collapsing under its own predictable weight. So one of the things that I, and, and one last thought I just wanted to mention, we've not talked about this before, you and I, but I was uh, reading through the literature last night, thinking about this afternoon's um, this, uh, 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 rendezvous. And one of the things, let me just say one thing to the viewers about heart rate. So the heart is the only organ in the body that gets its own blood supply in the time frame between contractions, let, let me develop that. So your elbow gets its blood supply when the heart contracts. The heart, if you will, draws its own breath, takes its own succor in that gap between contractions. So we had talked, uh, Dave and I earlier about heart rate variability, but let's sort of parachute into the life inside the heart. So when the heart rate slows, that allows the heart to draw that deep breath, stimulate those J receptors in the lungs and have that satisfied sense of fullness. So to say that we applied Apollo Neuro to a group of athletes here in, uh, in Minnesota, think this through for a second. These are athletes. So they're not itchy, twitchy. They're, they're, and they had a meaningful drop in their heart rate. And the benefit of that is wildly understated from in terms of the heart's um, in terms of the heart's long-term well-being. So again, the heart does less but accomplishes more. You, you imagine that people whose point of view you really respect, who are saying things that really intrigue you, they don't yell on top of the desk. They can speak softly and in whispers and command your attention. And that's kind of this moment that we really want to have that physiology uh, allow for itself to be self-refreshing. So when the heart rate slows and the resistance drops, 
we have a new freshness about us. And I think that's something that's immediately beneficial and, and probably evident. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, and I liken this, you know, you, you remind me when you're talking about this, it reminds me of Eric Kandel's work. I like your wine glass of water there. <laughs> Isn't that something? And it's the uh, force of, you know, Merrill's fat number 400 because it's completely impractical, <laughs> but it turns drinking water into a little bit of an art form. Okay. I like it. I like it. The vessel matters, you know? It does matter. The vessel matters, <laughs> right? So the water was just the water till it got poured into the glass. And, and traditional cultures, many of them, I've learned about this more recently and experienced myself, I don't want to diverge too far, but many traditional cultures use water treated in a very specific way, either with sound, music, copper vessels have a traditional, a long history of changing the, the, the texture of water and the, and the benefits of water in terms of its organizing, the water is a polar molecule, so literally the what we expose water to can actually organize the molecules differently and change the structure of water in the way that it interacts with our body. That's a conversation for another day. Yeah. Um, but what I really, what you reminded me of that I think is really fascinating is this idea that Eric Kandel discovered, you know, this that he won the Nobel Prize for in 2002. And this is, uh, uh, Eric Kandel is a world famous neuropsychiatrist and he discovered and won the Nobel prize for discovering the origins of learning and memory. And that the way that our mind forms and our body forms memory is no different from the way that ancient sea snails over 300 million years old with only 12,000 neurons form memories in response to safe, neutral and potentially threatening, survival threatening stimuli. And what's fascinating when you think about that and what the whole, all of his work from the 50 something plus years that he's been working in this field can be summed up as one thing that our mothers and fathers probably told us, many of have told us from the moment that we were able to understand it, which is that practice makes perfect. Right. And there's not necessarily some such thing as perfect. It's just a, a fun saying, but the point is that practice does make better and, and it, and it makes better things that we're doing that are constructive for us and things that are destructive. So as you were describing this, the eloquent metaphor of the dog that turns around to bite the owner, one way to think about this is that dog is burnout, right? That dog is peak performance without the balance of peak recovery. Right. And we cannot, no creature on the face of this earth, but especially us cannot sustain consistent peak performance. And we see this with athletes all the time. They cannot sustain, we cannot sustain consistent peak performance without prioritizing peak recovery equally, or we will burn out. And that dog will, that we've trained ourselves and we've trained over years, that dog will literally turn around to bite us and say, no, actually you can't do what you thought you could do because you haven't recovered enough. It's an interesting thing. It, it raises that what what mother said to us, and of course, as is always the case, is truer than we could have imagined. And I just would ask people to just think about something else that that is a I think a you know it's an organic follow up to what you said, which is the great value of being a beginner. So in life, we gather a skill set and we kind of surf that crumbling East Coast wave until we hit the beach, okay? And so it's not, I watch, I have the great fortune of raising six children and everything that they do, they're a beginner at. And nothing that I do, I'm a beginner at. And so it creates this model where, again, you know, the best prop of the future is the past, where if I was to say to my son, uh, who's 17 and plays a wicked Bach cantata. I think I'll try that. I'd probably be in that bronchospasm mode, sweating palms. But one of the things that is trying new things, being willing to be a beginner again and again, particularly for those of us who've been around the earth more than 18 times, you know, around the sun. I mean, I think it's really a valuable thing. And here with Apollo, we're starting to think about a gentle coaching, really a kind of um, just creating a new pattern. We all know, I, I, for example, am not the best 
sleeper in all of these years being obliged to wake up to a phone call for the most outlandish moment of the day going in to do a procedure at two in the morning with chairs going through the window and a total bar fight and so forth. So that I've, I've in a sense been victimized by that, right? And so now I'm always sleeping just a little bit below the surface while my wife is, is, is my as well, she's gonna need to be intubated, she's so relaxed. And so it, it strikes me that there's all kinds of opportunity here for us to be willing to engage in new things that we maybe, um, tend to walk away from, and it's a huge, refreshing dive in the cool water. That's a great metaphor. And I, I really do appreciate you taking the time to share all of this wisdom with us. This has really been an incredible conversation. We, uh, you may not have seen this, but we have had an incredible uh, uh, audience here today. Yeah, I'm seeing um, them go by, yeah. Yeah, so we, we have asked some of those. Yeah, we're gonna answer some questions. I think this is the, this is the time. It. We've had over 400 people today join us. I wanna thank every one of you for taking the time out. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I think the first question that came up a couple times that I can't think of anyone better to answer than you, uh, uh, Brian, is um, can you talk about atrial fibrillation in relation to stress and sort of how atrial fibrillation can be impacted by stress and how Apollo could potentially help if you think it could, you know, yes, it's it, it, it's such an interesting thing. Um, so when the blood returns from its journey through the body, it comes to the atrium. I, the question flashed by: If I was to go to that questioner's house tonight, knock on the door, and say, "Hey, I'm Brian Donahue," she would open the door and let me into the atrium of her home. So it comes from the original origin of receiving chamber. So the atrium is where the blood returns after its journey through the body. The atrium then contracts and the blood gets propelled into the big beating chamber of the heart that Dave and I have been talking about here, the, the ventricle. So that's why it's lub-dub, lub-dub like that. And that goes on throughout life. That rhythmic, coherent, organized uh, electrical activity is, is really what, what facilitates normal cardiac output. Very commonly, way more commonly than any of us had previously thought, turns out, the atrium fibrillates. So if we were to chart the conversation over the last hour between me and Dave, we would see Dave speaks, Brian speaks, Dave speaks. If we couldn't hear each other, we'd be talking at the same time. And if we charted it, we'd see this, this kind of hectic uh, background like the kids in the second grade classroom talking on a turn. That's what happens when the atrium fibrillates. So it quivers like a bag of worms. And here's the thing that happens. Blood is always given to clotting. Given the slightest pretext, it clots. And so what happens when the blood is not roaring through the atrium is it becomes adherent to the side of the atrium, becomes this thick pile of sticks on the edge of the river. And eventually as that pile of sticks grows, it breaks off, tumbles into the heart muscle, the ventricle, and heaven knows where the thing goes. So it's become, that's why there's all this business now about people getting all these watches and wearables and checking themselves and so forth, because at the end of that conversation is stroke. So atrial fibrillation is a very, very common uh, cause, as it turns out, tragically, of stroke. Like so many of the things that Dave and I have been talking about tonight, it's not all, it comes and goes. The old doctors made the point that there's a two to five year window when you're in and out of atrial fibrillation before you're inexorably in it. So it's during that two to five year window that you wake up unable to move your right arm. And that back and forth that, again, that little uh, cour de ballet it occurs until you're eventually in the AFib. One of the things that about this, this turn of phrase, I would prefer to call it on bad stress, okay? At stress, we would all be one-celled organisms in a warm swamp were it not for stress. So stress is the flywheel of evolution. Stress on the other hand, which is, which is destructive, which undermines us, which diminishes our governing intelligence. This isn't a good thing. And so, so the atrium is exquisitely innervated with nerves. And so as neural traffic changes, the signals that the atrium get are not all uniform. And so not surprisingly over time, as resistance in the heart muscle goes up, here's what really happens. Think Pink Floyd, one day older, one day shorter of breath. How does that actually happen? It happens because 
as the arteries constrict, the heart muscle adapts to that by becoming thicker, like a muscle in response to weight bearing. As it gets thicker, it gets stiffer. And then when it contracts, that concussive wave gets passed back to the atrium. It then over the years dilates, becomes the size of a two car garage. And that's when you fibrillate. So the key thing here is to understand that sequence. So we don't want the front end of this. If the bear doesn't put his hand in the, his paw in the trap, it doesn't snap shut, the tree doesn't fall and all that bad stuff doesn't happen. So not letting those arteries be constricted over the years is the best way to protect ourselves against these, these issues. So yes, yeah, so stress is a very important thing. Hypertension, look, I mean, again, you know, if we, honestly, there's 500 people in the audience, I'll bet you that even with this very selected audience, a lot of us aren't exactly at an ideal moment in our blood pressure, okay? And so, so the carrying cost of that is much greater than we thought. Atrial fibrillation is the new pandemic. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. And that's a really fantastic way of explaining it. I think that we, and we, and, and if stress, and, and again, we don't just to, so that everybody understands, we don't have studies yet on atrial fibrillation, um, but we have had many people in the community who have had atrial fibrillation who have told us self-reportedly that they feel that they fibrillate less when they use right. Apollo, which is really interesting because they feel less stressed out and they notice that their stress makes their AFib worse. Um, so I think as a general rule, I will tell you just, this is again, just from our community reporting to us, people with AFib, atrial fibrillation, don't particularly enjoy the energy and wake up setting because it can be too stimulating. Um, and I think that is probably the case, I would guess to extrapolate to most cardiac conditions. So if you are someone who falls into this category, again, we don't have studies on this yet. So keep this as a, as a caveat, but, um, the, the modes that seem to work the best for, for these folks who have these conditions are everything from the, from the social and open down to sleep, but not necessarily the energy and wake up. And we recommend using the, the protocol on the website that I've been sharing. If you have, uh, if you do use any of these settings, regardless of who you are, always start with the intensity low where start, as we say in, in medicine, start low and go slow. Right. Um, because the, because what most people don't understand, again, it's not our fault. We weren't taught it, but oftentimes in the body, less is more. Yes. And you don't need a, you don't need to turn the stereo up to max to, to hear your music, right? Sometimes music that's played low can be more soothing. And sometimes music that's played a little louder can be more soothing. It depends on the song and it depends on the moment and the other stuff that's going on around us. So, so that is, I think the best recommendation that I would give to everyone. Can I just add one thought to that? Of course, just please. Thought. There's two things about atrial fibrillation. One, we talked about the stroke risk and clot. But the other is this. If you had an old Porsche like I had, it had a good first gear and a good fifth gear. Second, third, and fourth weren't so good. So you could go at two miles an hour or you could go at 80 miles an hour, but that middle range wasn't so good. So AFib means that you lose those middle gears. You lose the finesse of heart rate and the heart rate tends to do what? Go up because the sympathetic nervous system dominates. So one of the expectations that I would have for Apollo in, in the setting of atrial fibrillation or ventricular dysrhythmias, our goal should be to lower systemic vascular resistance by impacting sympathetic resting tone let the heart slow down on its own. The patients that you describe here, Dave, who say, oh man, I didn't have AFib. Actually, they didn't have awareness of their, if you have AFib and your heart rate is slow, you don't know the difference. That's actually one of the problems that people don't know they have it. But when their heart rate is racing along, they have that sense of fatigue and lassitude because again, the heart gets its blood supply when? between contractions. As the heart rate goes up, that time goes down and the work the heart has to do goes up. So if we all stood up and started running faster than we could ever run before and not breathing any more than we are sitting here, wouldn't be a good thing. That was very well said. And I think the next follow-up that I think is a common misunderstanding is let's talk about blood pressure, right? We know, yes. high, we know high blood pressure results in a lot of chronic long-term problems and sometimes short-term problems. Yes. Can you talk about low blood pressure? Where, where do people usually want to sit? And what does the evidence say for where people want to be um, with their blood pressure? So, you know, within the limits of civility, what's happening is that 
It's like Chubby Checker asked with the limbo, how low can you go? So it turns out that low blood pressure is, is, is it, here's the key thing. Blood pressure should be lower than we thought. A recent study randomized people with mild to moderate hypertension into those two groups we talked about briefly, that is 130 or less versus 110 or less. By far the winning group is 110 or less. Now, if you're, if you're at 110 or less, you'll, there'll be times when you're at 94 or, okay. And so the, the, the key thing here, and this is something that I advocate to the patients, but I'm the first to say I'm not so good at myself, is being lavishly hydrated, okay? So if you're on antihypertensive medications, saw this twice today. So in the new era, we have to get more aggressive than we have been, Dave, at managing hypertension. Again, Paul said in Ephesians, beware danger seen and unseen. The big unseen danger, candidly, regarding hypertension is dementia. And so this was just, it can't go on like this. So when we get a little bit more aggressive and manage blood pressure with medications, diet, meditation, and now we're talking here about Apollo, again, all the above, thanks. What we see is that the top number comes down. There'll be periods when your blood pressure in the 90s. And at first, there might be a little bit of unsteadiness on the feet, but ask yourself, say that I had a problem with whiskey sours and Winston's and Dave walks down the street and he says, Doc, what are you doing? You're, it's two in the afternoon. You can't be having those whiskey sours in Winston. And he turns them all off for me. How's my life over that first couple of weeks? I want to find a voodoo doll of Dr. Dave. And, right? Yet we know that that transition from whiskey sours in Winston to sobriety and fresh air is much on our behalf. It doesn't mean that it's always downhill, comfortable and shaded. Sometimes the road from relative sickness to relative wellness is uphill, rutted and no fun at all. In fact, more often than not. So I think that we're in this for the long haul is, is the point. And we want the blood pressure lower. Everyone's gotten used to it. I'll, I'll tell you in the cath lab, it's an endlessly interesting thing. So a lot of people who have high blood pressure have plaque narrowings in the kidney arteries. And so the kidneys, from their perspective, the only thing they know is there's not a lot of blood around. So they make these really powerful chemicals that raise blood pressure. So now we came along in the 1990s, put little baby wires about the size of three of your hairs wound together down the kidney artery and open those arteries just like the heart arteries with stents. And you would see more than occasionally, people's blood pressure collapse. I mean, they'd go from 170, 180 to 60 or 70 systolic. And there was a swooning moment. Having said all that, you support people through that transition and they come through the far side, just like me and Dave flying our little bi biplane, you know, through the thunderheads. And we come through the far side and, and there's a whole new vista of life. So we have to be willing to make these transitions uh, on behalf of getting to a, a fuller uh, and more complete expression of health. Thank you so much for that. That's a, that's a wonderful answer to that question. Uh, it's a complicated question. You know, we're bombarded by so much information about blood pressure right. and the stuff from so many and so many different sources. It's, it's hard to tell. And, right. you know, it's what, what better source than from the guy who literally opens up people's arteries when, they're, arteries. when they're clogged. Right. Um, exactly. So one of the other questions I had for you, and, and I think, oh, actually, maybe I'll just chime in here. There's a few people ask questions that I can answer real quick. Does HRV affect the vagus nerve? HRV is a measurement yes. of vagus nerve activity and a measurement of the balance between activity in the vagus nerve and in that sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. The vagus nerve is the predominant major nerve fiber coming down from the, from the brain into the rest of the body often called the wandering nerve, I believe, with, because it goes to so many different places, that is the primary nerve of the parasympathetic recovery nervous system. Um, there's another great question that was, will COVID-19 help with side effects of the, uh, or sorry, will Apollo help with the side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine or the response to the vaccine? We don't know. Um, we would love to find out. So if any of you get vaccinated, please write us and let us know using your Apollo if it helps or not. I can tell you, we have had a ton of people tell us that when they have surgical procedures, including dental procedures, that the meditation and mindfulness protocol is a game changer for them for their discomfort during the procedure. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I personally use it every time I have to go for a dental procedure. I have to go for one next week. I'm ready. I'm ready with my meditation mindfulness mode. Um, somebody else asked what kinds of frequencies does Apollo use? So for those who are not that familiar with Apollo, it's very gentle vibrations that are sound waves. If you hold the Apollo next to your ear, you can actually hear them, but they're so gentle when they're delivered to the body that we typically can't hear them. Um, and, but, they're, but they are indeed sound waves that are based on the knowledge of how, of what Brian has been talking about today, the knowledge of how the respiratory system optimally works with the cardio, cardiovascular system and that it knows how it wants to work to work its best. And that it has this biological memory in the systems themselves, in the body. And so Apollo was, under, was based on the understanding of this, which has been studied for many, many decades. I actually I'd venture to say hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years in the Eastern practices of medicine um, to help the body reattain balance more effectively by reminding it that it's safe enough to remember what it, how it, what it knows about how to get back to balance, how to get back to optimal functioning. Um, and I think, you know, there's one, one a couple of other really great questions here. Thank you again to everyone for submitting these. Brian, I, feel free to, to, to disregard uh, or, or to dismiss this question if you don't know, because this is a tricky one, I think, but can you speak on how um, EMF uh, surrounding us with, you know, us being surrounded by tons of frequencies that we are not aware of, radio frequencies, other frequencies in the environment, all the devices around us, and things like 5G could impact cardiovascular health. Is there any knowledge of that in the literature to date? So there's lots of innuendo, right? Um, and I think it's a very real concern, and I, I congratulate the, the, the participant for raising the issue. It's also, on the other hand, important to begin with humility. When there's no data, there's no data. So we don't know, but so we don't know exactly. And remember that 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 magnetic fields cover a huge range in physics, right? And so, to some extent, they are tissue penetrating, and to some extent, they're not. So we probably don't need to think of them as a monolith. My sense, on the other hand, is that there are parts of the commercially utilized electromagnetic field that A, are relevant uh, uh, in terms of, of tissue penetration. We have no data, none whatever. Um, particularly, I guess I, most, of your, uh, most of our participants are a little bit aware of some of the, the innuendo about microwaves. I'm not particularly a fan myself of microwave. That's just an idiosyncratic and not a data-based uh, thing. I, um, and I, I do personally think that the structure, for example, of our home and the environment in which it lives has a great deal to do with our health. It's, an, it's, a, it's again, it's a Vedic point of view. It's not a traditional point of view, but, but um, you shouldn't, for example, I don't think it's favorable to sleep with all of these uh, the room should be wooden. It should be, you should sleep to the South. You don't need all these electric. You shouldn't have the computer and the television and all that. And it really does matter. Honestly, those little things matter. But if you said, well, tell me about the data. Answer is there is none. I just have to make one, one comment to something that Dave said. I, when I went to medical school, you know, I got into my first choice medical school and I couldn't believe I got in. And I promised myself I would look up every word that I didn't know, which was tons and tons of words. The word Vegas is so interesting to me. Um, in the old days, it's a little unsavory thought, but in the old days of doing autopsies, it was against the law. It was like going to the speakeasy in Chicago in 1922. And so bodies got moved around from one place to the next as the ancient doctors a thousand years, 2000 years before the birth of Jesus, dissected the body and no one knew about arteries, nerves and veins. And they found this thick, white, tenacious stuff, as Dave suggests, coming out of the skull. And as they moved things around and dissect, it went everywhere, which is where the English word, no, don't be a vagabond, no vagrancy in the parking lot. It comes from that. And it's interesting just to say, if the nerve goes everywhere, if it innervates everything from the, from this, from the top of the head to the soles of the feet, it has to matter. And it might be a little bit of an undervalued commodity. And the work that Dave has done might really be best seen to kind of 
remind ourselves of the transcendent value of the vagus nerve. Thank you so much for that, Brian. That's, that means a lot, um, especially with from someone with your background. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's, it is so fascinating, the origins of that word, right? Yes. And I, I've always found that interesting. Um, there were, we did receive a few questions on heart math um, and we do not work directly with heart math, but heart math is, for those who don't know, it's a biofeedback software hardware that came at the early days of HRV biofeedback. Yes. Um, that work was pioneered by uh, a couple of people, Dr. Vashilo, Dr. Gewurz, and Dr. Lehrer, um, and, uh, in the, in the HRV biofeedback space, which then became, uh, was used in large part to build the understanding of what heart math is, which is a, a, basically a home biofeedback device. Right. So you, you put a little pulse measurement, uh, device on your finger or on your ear. My, I think my last understanding was it was an ear clip yes. and it measures your heart rate and your HRV over time to assess the relationship between the, the breathing pattern, the lungs mo moving and oscillating, and then the frequency of heart beats and heart oscillations and HRV, the rate of change over time of the heartbeat. And what we know from the biofeedback literature that heart math has, has um, agreed on and called coherence is that when we bring uh, the heart math, the, the biofeedback literature calls it resonance, but they're the same thing which is right. that when we breathe in a certain way, which is somewhere between five and seven breaths per minute, slightly different for everyone. Most people it's right around 5.5 .5 breaths per minute. We are able to self-induce a state of balance in the body very, very quickly, like within seconds to minutes. And in most people, something like 95% of people breathing at this rate can induce that balance within 90 seconds. I challenge you all to try this. 90 seconds of doing breathe in five and a half seconds, maybe hold for a second, exhale five and a half seconds, hold for a second, and do that for 90 seconds. And I would bet that most of you would feel pretty calm afterwards. I know it works for me, and it, it does take a little practice to get used to doing this in, the, in regular life, but it is an incredibly powerful technique, and that's what heart math is based on training people to do. Um, but Apollo, in relation to heart math, is interesting because people who use heart math have told us that they can reach coherent states more easily with Apollo, and they can stay in coherence more easily with Apollo, which is exactly what we see in the lab at the University of Pittsburgh with when we do right. the, the biofeedback analysis. Um, so Brian, I have an interesting one for you. What's your, what's your routine like? What I know you're, you know, you're, you're a, a really hardworking guy. You're what we'd call a, a high achiever. Um, you know, what, what's your routine like? So there's so little in, in my life that I currently have in common with myself as opposed to when I was 18. But the one thing that is, uh, is that I practice meditation. So I spend, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, but to answer the question plainly, I spend one and a half hours a day uh, in meditation and have been uh, very much, uh, and it turns out that you think, well, holy cow. But, you know, it's one of those things that has been, it, it is of such immeasurable benefit to me. So um, my own, I, I have been interested as Dave knows in the general orbit of Ayurvedic knowledge and have found these things to be the case. First, there is no conflict. By that I mean, this it, it sounds very esoteric and arcane. It's incredibly practical, okay? Think of it like Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. And if you drive a motorcycle, probably a good thing to know something about its maintenance. And likewise for us, and so I have found that the general axioms of the Ayurvedic technique are very, very practical. It's interesting that the Ayurvedic technique, Ayurvedic physicians make their diagnoses by a kind of process of cognizing the arteries. So if you, so, and I'm not myself, but one of the things that's happening now is that they, the, the advocates of this are looking to make this easy for us to do ourselves. 
And so it turns out that we can uh, learn a great deal about both where we are physiologically and where it is we ought to maybe be by an understanding of these pulse contours. We didn't talk this evening about some of the details of that, these endlessly intriguing and enigmatic things called Meyer waves. I mean, but the pulse is itself an innocent mirror reflecting the entire of the, of the physiology. And people think, well, here's the brain. No, actually, actually, the pulse tells us, I have personally seen examples, stunning examples of insight into the physiology by understanding the, the, the pulse contours. But my own routine basically is I, I do meditate morning and evening. I do try to maintain to some extent a fasting state during the morning hours. Um, um, not hard to do when you get up and meditate and go to work and things are popping quickly. And I try to emphasize, and I recommend this to people, I try to emphasize taking calories at noon. I never did this only because it's easy to keep working in particular doing procedures and so forth, but best that we take a meal at noon. Even if we can't have it be the big meal, even take calories at noon, okay? That's a very important thing. One way to understand this is that the end product of digestion matters greatly. So in perfect digestion, we end up with something called soma or um, it's very uh, it's like, a, like a sap imperfect digestion and we get something else, which is a, a gummy material that causes inflammation and, and vascular disease and the like. So try to favor those calories coming early in the day, lighten up the evening calories and get to bed a little earlier. Thank you so much for that, Brian. That was a great, great note to end on. I really, and we all are so grateful for you taking the time to join us today. I know, I know how busy you are. You, ba you barely had time to take off your coat before you could fill the wine glass with but water. But I did take off my scrubs, <laughs> okay? <to run. laughs> okay, so, so. Well, again, thank you so much. So much gratitude for you and so much gratitude for everyone who took the time to join us today. We tried right. our best to answer as many questions as we could. Um, many of the questions that you asked were actually answered within our conversation earlier on, and that conversation will be available uh, through the Apollo Neuro uh, YouTube channel. Um, and I think links will be sent out when that's uploaded. And um, we really appreciate you being so engaged and interested and in asking all of your questions. Keep them coming. Um, please feel free to reach out to us in other ways on social, um, at Apollo Neuro on Instagram. You can also reach out directly to me on Instagram at uh, Dr. David Rabin. And um, we have, uh, actually, it's, sorry, it's at David Rabin. Uh, and, we have, and we have so many more exciting conversations to bring to you. Um, but with that, to be respectful of your time, Brian, we're gonna wrap. So I'm gonna leave you with the last word and thank you so much again for joining us. So my last word to this amazing audience, I'm watching these uh, things fly by and I just, uh, and your comments are very much appreciated. You, uh, this, this, this great outpouring of, of, of sentiment is deeply appreciated. And it is kind of one of those moments where, um, you know, life imitates art. It's very soothing and therapeutic for Dave and I much like putting on an Apollo to see all of you here engaged, listening and, and, and being appreciative. Thank you very much and good night to everybody. Thank you. Thank you all and thank you, Brian. Take care and have a lovely weekend.